Good afternoon, guys. And uh, let's see if this focuses. I'm not supposed to talk until I'm focused. It still looks blurry to me. Hmm. Tell me when. So we'll step back. Now step forward. Now step forward. Okay, so Francis is late. Sixty more seconds. Okay. There we go. Done. Excellent. So, welcome, class of two thousand twenty-five. I will tell you that uh, when Dr. Battinelli and I first started this endeavor, it was two thousand eight. And uh, we had just paid our money uh, to the LCME for the permission to begin the process of planning a medical school. And uh, a lot of years have passed and you're the uh, 11th class, uh, I think the 11th class to sit here. So you know that we spend a lot of effort orienting you to medical school. Now in COVID time, you didn't have as much fun as most classes did when it wasn't COVID. We didn't have all the exciting activities uh, in, in Manhattan and, and locally on Long Island, but we certainly made an effort to orient you. So to get put white coat ceremony in perspective, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of some stories about how I was oriented to medical school. I got a postcard in the mail that said on September 10th, go to room B. That was it. That was my entire orientation of medical school. <coughs> room B was not an orientation room. It was a lecture hall. I walked in, looked around, didn't know a single person in my class, sat down in the back left corner of the room where I always loved to sit, uh, and was waiting for the orientation, like, hello, welcome to, to medical school. But instead, a professor walked out, said, first slide, please, and proceeded to give an anatomy lecture without saying a single word of hello or anything else, he started to ask a few questions. I didn't, I wasn't really even focusing on the idea that you would raise your hand when someone was asking a question. When I realized that like two thirds of my class was flailing their arms to be called on. So I said, I am definitely in the right seat in the far back because I've never had the urge to be called on in a classroom in my life. and. But I said, but who are these people that want to be called on so much? That was my first exposure to medical school, that I was with a, a group of people more competitive than I had ever met in my life. And uh, but again, nobody introduced us. We didn't have name tags. And uh, so on it went. So about day three, at the end of the lectures in the morning, by the way, we had six hours of lectures five days a week. There was no active learning. Uh, they said, everybody, please go down to student affairs and get your index card so you can get your white coats. Oh, that sounds pretty cool, white coats. So we all go, we get our index card and it has my name on it. And it has the date. It has the number of white coats you were given. And that's it. And, it, and when it has an address at Bellevue Hospital. Now I had never been in Bellevue Hospital at that time. Bellevue Hospital was 14 buildings separated by passageways that were subterranean. Not the easiest place to actually find a room. And so in I went right through the main door. There's the security guard says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for my white coat. He looks at me, says, this is pathetic. I can see this is not going to go well, but he says, OK, go ahead. And probably 25 minutes later, I stumbled below ground through two other buildings to the bottom of the pathology building. Fortunately, there were no cadavers around. They weren't doing autopsies that morning. And I walked through a room and there's a big desk and one woman sitting behind the desk. 
And as I walk up, she goes, you. She reaches back and she pulls two white coats. These will fit perfectly. And she puts them right out on me. She says, give me your card. I take the card, she writes two on it, she keeps it. And she says, you lose them, you pay for them. And that was it. That was the white coat ceremony. I picked up the white coat. I went home, I said, huh, this medical school stuff is really warm and fuzzy. Uh, and literally, that was my orientation to medical school. NYU Medical School, 1972. Uh, fortunately, we've come a long way in welcoming you to what hopefully is one of the most important experiences of your life, going through four years and transforming yourself from the person you are today sitting here to a doctor. And the white coat ceremony is the initiation. So for the people who are not here today because of COVID, your family, your friends, the Zuckers who gave us the wonderful gift to name our medical school that has helped with financial aid uh, enormously. The Gold Foundation, who you're gonna hear about from Dr. Batnelli. Uh, the group, the, Dr. Gold was the person who started the white coat ceremony. He was a pediatric neurologist. So all of those things, this is a kickoff of a symbolic moment where the profession of medicine says, you're in if you want to be in. And we will help you get to where you want to go. But you have to be willing to let go of who you are and join this club called the profession of medicine. And we have a lot of rules to that club, but it's a really welcoming place. So unlike NYU in 1972, we will welcome you. We care a lot about you. And uh, this is the beginning of the rest of your life. So let me pass this to Dr. Batten. And by the way, please don't get your arms totally stuck in the, the white coats while we're trying to get it on. It's, it's the wrestling match is really bad for COVID contact. <laughs> So I might have to do the same thing. Okay, blurt is gone. Okay, good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Batnelli. I'm the Vice Dean here at the School of Medicine and the Chief Medical Officer at Northwell. And my role today is to tell you a little bit about the Gold Foundation. So this is, as Dr. Smith said, our 11th white coat ceremony here at the Zucker School of Medicine. Um, the Gold Foundation. What you need to know and why it's important nationally and why it's important locally here at our school. Arnold Gold, as Dr. Smith said, was a world renowned pediatric neurologist at Columbia University in the College of Physicians and Surgeons. He and his wife, Sandra Gold, and their colleagues at Columbia began the foundation actually in 1988 with the power of an idea. And that was to nurture and preserve the, the tradition of the caring physician. Unfortunately, Dr. Gold passed away a few years ago, but his wife and the Gold Foundation, I think may be watching today, um, have been incredibly supportive of all these efforts and in particular, uh, this School of Medicine. So the idea was conceived in response to a trend that Dr. Arnold Gold witnessed. And in fact, he feared that the burgeoning scientific discoveries and advances in technology were shifting the focus of medicine away from the caring, from caring for the whole person to in fact an over-reliance on technology, that we were scientifically well-trained, technologically proficient, but demonstrating a lack of caring and empathy and compassion. Dr. Gold, along with his wife Sandra's help, decided to do something about it. So they put forth that humanistic medical care is not simply just about compassion. It is the best of medicine. When skilled physicians build caring, trusting, and collaborative relationships with patients, studies show that more appropriate medical decisions, better patient adherence to treatment protocols, and less, less costly healthcare outcomes, in fact, are the result. The foundation's logo, which each of you will get, is a heart-shaped heart stethoscope, a very familiar site in medical schools and centers throughout the country and abroad. It is featured and worn on the lapel by over 20,000 medical students, over 95% of the schools participating and has grown from the allopathic through the osteopathic through the nursing schools and in fact recognized by residency programs as well. 
very importantly, the work of this foundation is recognized by medical schools because they also feature a number of other things, including the, the gold Humanism Honor Society, which is a peer selected honor given after the third year of medical school, which symbolizes those students who demonstrate the utmost humanism and compassion in the delivery of care. And this is the only other honor society other than Alpha Omega Alpha and is heavily weighted by residency training programs who know that they want physicians who are not only technically and scientifically proficient, but also um, clearly the humanism value that they want. So let me talk a little bit about the timing of this event. So at most other schools, including the schools that Dr. Smith and I and others were at previously, they would give you your white coat on the first day of medical school. Um, some actually wait to the last day of medical school. I'm not sure about that part. Uh, but we said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not going to give this, the, the coats out on the first day of medical school because Dr. Smith mentioned something critically important. And that is that this journey from becoming a pedestrian, a person, uh, a matriculant in the school to, in fact, a doctor is a transformation. And you have gone through the first part of that transformation. And we've decided that after you have earned your stripes, so to speak, and your pin and your EMT training, that now's the time to don that white coat and symbolically move you through the rest of that process. So I wanna thank Sandra and the Gold Foundation for their continued support. And I want to make sure that you understand that um, we value you succeeding. We value you learning clinical medicine, but maybe most of all, not just us, but our patients probably value the humanism more than anything that you could ever imagine. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over this program to Dr. Waldenberg, who as the Dean of Admissions is uh, at least mostly responsible for having you attend the school, recommending you be accepted to the Dean and the rest of the committee. So she's gonna read the names and we're gonna go through the process of presenting you with your white coats and pins symbolizing your EMT training and your induction into the white coat ceremony and the school. Congratulations. Okay, so while everybody is uh, getting ready, uh, just a little bit about uh, the class. You'll hear 101 names today. There are 52 women and 49 men, uh, 95 MDs, two oral maxillofacial program participants, and four MD PhDs. 16 states are represented in this class from as north as Minnesota, to as south as Georgia and Mississippi. And uh, we have 58 colleges and universities represented in our group of 101 students. So quite a lot of diversity, obviously, in our group. And uh, I'm very honored and privileged to uh, present them to all of you watching today and hopefully celebrating with you as well. They're quite a fabulous bunch of students. Okay. We will start with Sarah Abramowitz. <laughs> Obi Aja. Eric Alper. <laughs> Amna Aslam.
Brianna Bellin. Oh. Alexis Victoria Benjamin. Apratim Corey Bomick. Andrew Branch. Kaylee Brogan. Garrett Brown. <laughs> Mona Bugagas. Annalise Bowie. Jonathan Carboni. Catherine Torney Carroll. Robert Chang. Matthew Chen. <laughs> Crystal Chen. Chisholm Chigose Osu. <laughs> Caroline Chu. <laughs> Madeline Coffey. Christopher Copeland. <laughs> Zermina Dawood. Anna Dates. <laughs> K. 
Kayla Dillon. Darwin Lloyd Edwards III. Joshua Elbaz. Rebecca Epstein. Jared Faith. Abigail Fida. Robert Flatow. Yocheved Friedman. Stephen Gams. Christopher Gasparis. <laughs> Carolyn Habiger. Maya Hare. Amanda Emily Hay. Colin Siva Hill. Calvin Huang. Brandon Impostato. Kristen John. Brad Johnson. Bong Suk Jung. In you, Eric Kang. <laughs> J. 
Jonathan Capillion. Adam Kaufman. Young Jew Thomas Kim. Julia Kim. Mary Grace Kraus. Harrison Laban. <laughs> Ashley Lamba. Joseph Landers. Jonas Levitt. Kelly Lee. Brendan Lynn. Angelina Lionetta. Joshua. David McBriar. <laughs> Lauren Milley. <laughs> Brooke Catherine Milosh. Emilio Moret. Akash Mishra. Diana Marie Mora. Andrew Moran. Margot Noel. Christopher Noyes.
Kenena Onyebike. Alexis Palmer. Himanshu Patel. Kush Patel. Maya Natalia Pavlovich. John Portelli. Harice Kwashi. James Raglo DeFranco. Lisa Ramirez. Rasmin Ryan. Evan Rebesk Bolanos. <laughs> Natalie Rivas. Emma Robinson. Vanessa Ross. Searsha. Ryan. Sarah Sawicki. Jordan Schneider. Neva Shafian. Harshal Shah. Haley Striegel. (laughs) 
Romina Tafreshi. Cindy Asayo Takigawa. Katie Tam. Jaron Thomas. Catherine Thompson. Kiera Thompson. Michael Thompson. <laughs> Hannah Travers. Helen Urenya. <laughs> Rachel Weeks. <laughs> Rachel Weissman Sukamoto. Han Wen Yang. Chris Zamore. And now I'll just read the names of the few students who chose to attend virtually. And they are Frederick Zhang. Vincent Dong. John Fallon. and Syed Abbas Raza. And now a big round of applause for everyone. The entering 2021. Breath away, Connor. It's a little creepy. <laughs> Just go blurry, huh? Okay. Well, congratulations to everybody. Fantastic job. But I have to take very little credit for my expertise in coding you because Dr. Battinelli said to me beforehand, here's the secret. Put the coat low, let them get their hands in the sleeve and then lift it up. 
If they try to wrestle it at shoulder height, it's a mess. So you guys did great, but I, I give David credit. The other thing you should know, uh, in the rules of operating a medical school, there is only one thing the dean is forbidden to do, and that is to make any decision whatsoever on the admission of any individual to the medical school. It's the only thing I can play no role in. So this class is the product of this amazing person, and you should give Dr. Waldenberg a round of applause. And I will tell you that uh, this is a really special day. One of my favorites. I feel very bad for all of us because normally this is one of the two days, this and graduation, when you family friends typically were staying for a party that would last into the night. Uh, and uh, it was really one of the true celebratory days and COVID will pass. And uh, hopefully we'll return to that again but it is a great day for you and I wanna congratulate you. I also wanna tell you a little bit about what my impression of this white coat ceremony is. And that is that it is symbolic of entering the profession of medicine, but what does that really mean? It means that you are ready to take the journey to become somebody different from who you are sitting here today. Somebody whose reflexes and default ways of seeing the world and other people is the way a doctor sees them. The way you can give empathy to people, even in the most difficult circumstances. The way you can be tough on yourself when you know that you didn't do your best job. All of those things are part of the culture that great doctors eventually completely absorb and happens without you thinking ever again. And it's part of what earns you the right to have all the other people in the craziest places call you doctor because they know it isn't that you are only called doctor when you're actually delivering medical care, but that you are a doctor. And that is a special thing in our society. And they acknowledge it by calling you doctor in every which place. And all you have to do is earn that. And earning it is simply embracing what it means to be a doctor and every day struggling to get a little bit better. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. So when I was at Stony Brook many, many years ago, uh, we had a celebration of cancer therapy because there had been some major breakthroughs made. And uh, one of the people that they asked was actually uh, a Jesuit priest who had taught me at Fordham. And he came in and he was a pretty renowned uh, philosopher. And he came in and we were all, everybody was waiting because he was really well known and the whole faculty was on edge that we could get this amazing person to come and talk to all of us at Stony Brook. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting and people said, I guess he stood us up. And all of a sudden, in the corner of the room, this guy came down the stairs and he was re wearing a really grungy t-shirt, jeans, ripped sneakers, and he had a, a cup of coffee in a paper cup that had shrunk about an inch from when he first filled it. And he walked down looking like somebody that we should call the security guards on. He put the coffee on the podium. He looked up and started talking and 45 minutes later, you could have heard a pin drop in that auditorium. Because what he described, he had been one of the major anti-Vietnam war protesters. He had been in jail for many years uh, in the pre-computerized uh, era. He actually burnt all the draft records in Catonsville, Maryland, and nobody ever got drafted there because nobody knew whose records he burnt. Today, unfortunately, if there was a draft, you would still get drafted. But he came and he said, had failed us. It had not protected those Vietnamese. We had no right to be going over there and killing. And he said, so I decided to never go back to academia. And what he did, the AIDS epidemic had just started and he took a job 
at one of the hospitals on the west side of Manhattan. It no longer exists now, but at the time it was 100% HIV patients. And he got a job as a nurse's aide. This was a famous, famous faculty member, with hundreds of publications. And he was working as a nurse's aide, totally anonymously in this hospital, St. Clair's Hospital on the west side of Manhattan. And what he told us was his impressions from the foot of the patient watching doctors deliver care for good and for bad. And he told us his observations, a totally not medical person. And what I remember was he, he, he gave observations that made you you're really happy you were joining medicine and observations that made your hair stand on end uh, at how somebody could be that unsympathetic and uncaring for these patients. It was an era when half the doctors wouldn't touch the patients for fear of getting AIDS. Uh, and he finally said, here's the deal. I know what I want for my doctor. I want them to wake up every morning and try to get a little closer every day to the person they know they must become to be the ideal doctor. And never will they have a day where they don't move a little bit closer and they know they're never gonna get there, but they never stop trying to get closer and closer to becoming the doctor they know they would want as a patient. And I leave you with that thought because you're at the very beginning of this process. Every day, try to get a little closer. You know what a good doctor is because you've all been sick, you've all encountered doctors. You know what caring is versus just doing your job. You know what making a human connection is versus dispensing a service. And I don't want you to do any of those second things. I want you to do all of the first things. And I want you to be hard on yourself because to get to that person that you know you should be is a lot of work and it's never selling yourself short and pretending you're great when you haven't made it there. Your patients will always know. You know, the one thing I always knew Patients aren't so good at figuring out whether you're a super specialist, whether you're the, the smartest endocrinologist or rheumatologist or neuroradiologist in the world. But what they always know is whether you care about them. Every patient knows whether you care about them or not. Remember that because whatever you do with a patient from ICE next week, the first time you see patients in somebody's office, every patient will know whether you are just doing your assignment or whether you're looking at them as a real person. And that's what I wish for you because it is in knowing your patients that you get paid for being a doctor. It's those relationships that make the whole thing worthwhile. The stress, the fatigue, the warmth, the reward. The, everybody will make a reasonable salary. No, I don't know very few doctors who are uh, you know, on going to food banks and you'll never get really rich. It's a really nice thing. You'll be somewhere in the middle, secure and happy to go to work every day. When I first went into practice, I finished my residency and I finished my draft obligation to the US Army. And uh, I went into practice and the very second day I was in practice, the nurse said to me, so Dr. Smith, how much do you wanna charge that patient? I said, oh my God, I've never charged anybody. In fact, I didn't know anybody would pay for me to take care of them. I said, uh, I have no idea. So there was an older internist there. And I turned to him and I said, Jerry, how much do I charge for this? And he, this was like the charge sheet. And he grabs the sheet and he says, don't ever fill this out. You just hand it to the secretary and you tell her, do the best you can, but never overcharge. And never you fill out a charge because that's not what doctors do. They don't fill out charges. They take care of patients. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm 70 years old and I would do this job every day if I never got paid again. Nothing else I do makes me as happy as walking in this office and seeing my patients. And those are the things I wish for you. I've experienced many of them, not every day. Every day is not a good day, 
but I've experienced a lot of them. And I know that the real payment for being a doctor is not money. It's those relationships. It's the eyes of that patient who's afraid and you make them less afraid. It's the eyes of the family when you console them because the outcome is not gonna be good, but the suffering can be ameliorated. All those things are what makes being a doctor the greatest occupation in the world. Don't cheat yourself out of that. Nothing else substitutes for that. And so with that, congratulations on your white coat and have a great four years here and a great career in medicine. I read the map. No, you got to do the old. Oh, 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 no, wait, okay. So guys, I want you to look at the oath. You're the 11th class. No class has ever been capable of saying this oath with me in any cadence that sounded anything other than chaos. So I'm going to talk relatively slowly for a New Yorker. And you see where it says oath, don't read oath. Start reading underneath the I swear to fulfill. And let's see if, the 103 of you, or however many, can actually say this together. Are you ready? Everybody stand up, raise your hand. Okay, Dave, are you ready? Dave's ready. All right. I swear to fulfill, don't follow me, talk, say it with me, start over. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment, this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially, I tread with care in matters of life and death and never abuse the power that has been bestowed upon me. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect not only the person, but a family and community. I will prevent disease whenever I can for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. I will maintain the health of my own body and mind so I am able to discharge my duties appropriately. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest of my calling. May I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Congratulations. Congratulations class, please. Go into the lobby and take lots of photographs and celebrate your accomplishments.